Hello and welcome to Indie Designer Journal episode 15. Today's topic is the discussion of one of my favorite games and that is Above and Below by Red Raven Games uh, designed by Ryan Lockhart and illustrated by Ryan Lockhart. Now, <clears throat> the overall or the overarching um, topic for today isn't going to be necessarily delving into this game because as you know, I don't really review games. I just look at the uh, mechanics that I find interesting as a designer and discuss those. Um, so there's quite a few of them in this game, obviously. Um, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Ryan's because I sort of attempt to emulate him in some ways. Um, he does most of his, obviously does a lot of his own design and he does all of his own artwork. So I try to do that myself in my own games. And that's kind of where the comp comparison ends. He, um, well, I guess we both did a lot of Kickstarters early on. I think he's moved away from that format. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but he does more distribution. He gets things manufactured overseas. I think he was using Panda Manufacturing for a while. I don't know if he still is, um, but he does um, bigger scale. I'm obviously an indie designer. I do things on a much smaller scale, but I do love that he um, builds these worlds, and that's what I try to do. So um, anyways, the overarching topic of today is borrowing aka stealing ideas from other designs slash designers now this is a topic that i see come up all the time on facebook and other um, social media especially obviously in the design forums when people are maybe newer to um, board game design and they want to put patents on their ideas and once in a while you do see someone blatantly steal an idea We've seen this happen a couple of times for sure that I can remember on Kickstarter where someone literally just steals a design and tries to pitch it off as a, their self, as their own. And typically Kickstarter um, gets involved and cancels the project. But for the most part, 99% of the time, no one's going to steal your entire idea. Now, there's a gray area, and that is the area in which, as designers, we play games. That's probably the best way to become a good designer, is to play as many different types of games as you can. If you get stuck playing only one type of game, you're going to miss out on other things. So, Above and Below is a worker placement game. I, I do enjoy worker placement games. It's not necessarily my favorite type of game, but by playing all different types of games, you're gonna learn different mechanisms and scoring, um, um, ways of scoring and, and such that are going to make you just a better designer overall because you're gonna have a bigger pool of things to pull from. And that's where um, things kind of get murky. And I don't, And for me, it's not murky. For me, it's pretty crystal clear, but I'm saying it's murky out in the, the stratosphere of social media, or, or maybe just in people's minds. Uh, how much can you take from another person's design before it becomes, you know, grand larceny? Now, personally, my feeling on that is, it is, I have zero problem with someone including myself, taking a mechanism from a game and reutilizing it. If it's a super like core mechanism to a game, you you better maybe do a, quite a few changes to it before presenting it to put to the public. Um, but there's actually, the reason why I'm, I'm, we're gonna look at above and below is because there's two things, two mechanisms in above and below that um, I have used. Now, I don't know if they even originate there, and that's what's interesting about design and basic, basically creativity in general. You go back to the masters in, of art and, and painting. They weren't just, um, they didn't come out of a cave and just start creating masterpieces. Um, they studied the masters before them, right? and then the masters after them studied those masters and so forth and so on. Game design, though it's not painting the 16th chapel, is very similar in that regard. Games evolve. You see a new mechanism or a new mechanic comes to, um, comes to the market. So, uh, for instance, uh, Dominion, which I have behind me somewhere here. Uh, I don't know where it's at. No, it's down here. Dominion, great example, right? It brought deck building sort of to the market and how many deck building games did we see come out after that? They're still coming out, right? It's a great mechanism. Some people don't like it, some people do, but without that initial creation, 
other designers wouldn't have been able to build upon it, right? So if you're going into game design and you're thinking that you're going to patent some idea or you want to get a, a trademark or a patent, it's first of all very difficult to do. I know a couple of lawyers, so first of all, let me tell you, I'm not a lawyer, so everything I say here is just me from my perspective. Um, don't take it for, you know, for you know biblical um fact but my understanding is that it's very difficult to do to get a, a, me a mechanic a, a specific mechanic copyrighted or trademarked or what oh, copyright would be the correct term and i don't think i've never copyrighted any of my work in the past um i mean i copyrighted by just simply writing copyright that's all you really have to do as long as it's out in the public um no one's usually people aren't going to steal your entire idea but getting back to my point as designers um we're creators we're creating content from something and the the, the greater your pool of of knowledge on that subject the the better you're going to be prepared to create so the more games you play the better designer you're likely going to be now that's not again 100 percent, but usually the more games you play it makes sense that you're going to be a better designer because you're going to have more things to reference now as designers we're innovating we're building off of of ideas that are old um most games that come out are similar to another game. That's why you see all the time on social media and Facebook groups or whatnot, someone saying, I like this game, I like game A, uh, can you recommend another game that's like game A, right? Why, why do we do that? Because there, we know that there's so many games with so much overlap. It's very rare for a game to be completely on its own unique. Even some of the games that we consider the most unique um, do derive their base mechanics or some of their mechanics from other things. So my point is you're not creating, you're never really gonna create something completely mind-blowing or new. You're always gonna be borrowing from the past. So today we're gonna look at Above and Below. I'm gonna show you a couple of things in here that I really love about this game. It's an older game now, I guess you'd consider it older. And it came out in 2015 or 16, somewhere in there. I've played it quite a few times. And I'm just going to show you how, as a designer, you're going to play a game and you're going to be like, wow, this answers a question for myself. So sometimes you'll be designing something and you'll be stuck. Well, how am I going to handle this in the game? I want to find a way to handle this that's going to make sense mechanically you know, with the theme. And the more games you play, like I said, you're going to have that pool of um, mechanics in your head that you can draw from. Oh, I, I remember this game. I played this, and that's how they handled the scoring for that. So I could implement that here. That would work perfectly. It would make sense, blah, blah, blah. So I guess my conclusion um, on the matter is you're not going to be creating anything revolutionarily new now maybe you will maybe there's there are those games like i said dominion brought forth a new idea but i'm sure that idea came from something else you know what i mean there's always you're always building upon other ideas now i think it's important as a designer especially a new designer to feel open about sharing your design with people the more you get it out in the open and share it open, make a facebook page make a blog whatever you got to do get that out there because then when or go on bgg is another good source if you're out there with your design the less likely someone is going to steal it. Now, if you're very secretive about it, and maybe you're only showing a few people here and there, maybe at cons or at protospiels or something like that, that's where I think the potential is for someone to you know, take your entire idea and run with it. Um, the more open you are with your design, I try to be as forward as I can, especially with UnderQuest that I'm doing right now, I'm trying to share the entire process the best that I can with everybody to show, well, I had this idea, well, I'm gonna scrap that idea, I'm gonna change it, I'm gonna do this now, because that's how, how I work as a designer. I, I build something, I look at it, I you know, run, run it through the ringer, if it doesn't work, I scrap it and move on. So I'm trying to share that experience. And in doing so, 
I'm getting my game out there and it's publicity, right? That's good. But it's also almost, you're, it's, you're, you're, you're um, putting your copyright, you're, you're putting your stamp on it. So if someone comes up and if someone right now were to come out with a game called UnderQuest and it was, looks a lot like my game and shared a lot of the mechanics, I'm pretty sure the community as a whole would call them out and say, hey man, you're stealing, right? And, and they would be shut down immediately because the hobby game world or design world is pretty small and we pretty much have each other's back so with that being said be up be out there with your game don't be afraid don't think you have to patent everything um share as much as you can share art share the process i think it's important and you're only going to help yourself in so many ways like i mentioned before but you're going to get feedback from people who have experience playing other games like i listen to all the comments and the feedback that i get and i'm learning about games i didn't know existed and i'm being able to implement things that i didn't know um, because i'm being open the more open you are um, with your design the more uh, uh, feedback you're going to get that's going to help you so that's another bonus to being open Anyways, let's turn this camera around. It's enough of me ranting. Um, I did want to cover that topic. And let's look at some of the mechanisms in above and below that I enjoy and that I have stolen from um, Red Raven Games. Thanks. Okay, welcome to the table. Here we have some of the components that come inside the box for above and below. Like I said, I'm not going to set the whole thing up and show you exactly how it plays. But essentially you're going to have these workers and what is really interesting about um, above and below is that your workers, it's a worker placement game. So many of the worker placement games prior to above and below, um, you basically had a meeple and, or a worker and you would, um, it would just, every worker could just take different actions, right? We've, we've played millions of games like that, right? Stone, Stone Age or Lords of Waterdeep. Um, your workers are you know essentially all the same but in this game they all have different abilities and strengths so some of them can repair things or build things i should say some of them are better at um combat or adventuring some of them are better at hiring other uh characters or other uh workers for you so each one's a unique um, person and I think that is great because what that did for this game is create qu quite a bit of personality you get sort of attached to these little characters and you got robots and little fish people and little well, of course who doesn't want a cat so I think what this did for me anyways is is really build a theme and of course Ryan's artwork is is beautiful and whimsical and um, creates a very interesting sort of uh, atmosphere but um, so that's one of the unique things uh, in this game. I, I haven't made a worker placement game, so to speak. So I haven't yet stolen this idea, but I think that if I were to ever make a um, worker placement game that I would utilize something like this where every um, character or um, worker that you have had some unique abilities. Now you've seen games since uh, Above and Below that really started implementing this more and more. It's become more of a common theme. Um, and I'm not, I don't, haven't played every worker placement game, so I'm not gonna say this is where the, uh, it's, it originated, but this is the first time that I saw um, a worker placement game that utilized um, something along that lines. Now there's gonna be a market, just like in most worker placement games, where you can build buildings to make your, um, you're gonna have a little tableau of buildings that you can build that are gonna give you benefits and allow you to reroll dice or uh, manipulate the game or, or end uh, ways to score points at the end of the game. What's interesting about um, this game is you can also go on adventures. Now this is where I'm sort of utilizing some of um, this game. I'm borrowing um, some of the mechanics from this game. You can choose as an action on your turn to go on an adventure. You get to decide how many um, workers and or people you're going to send on that mission. That's going to help you do the more people you send up. Obviously the, the better the chances you are to get a better outcome. But how this works is there's uh, these little uh, cards that here they are right in front of my face that have numbers on them and then uh, you roll a dice. So you roll one of these dice and it tells you what entry to read. Now there's the base game comes with this huge encounter book and they're just, you know, in numerical order. You find your thing. Well, you don't find it. Someone else takes the book and reads, um, reads to you the entry and then they give you the two options without telling you the result you make that decision 
And then um, you would see if you can actually do that result by rolling dice. And if you succeed, you get some sort of um, a reward for that. Or if you fail, you usually, I think you get nothing in this game. So it's pretty, adventures are pretty um, difficult, I think. In my opinion, the above and below with just the base encounter book. Um, and going on, um, going on adventures is not as good as it could be. Um, it, 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 it's a lot spicier when you add this um, additional book, uh, the Under Forest and Desert Labyrinth Encounter book. So this is another book you can, I think you can download the PDF for it, I'm not sure. But it just adds a bunch more stories. It picks up numerically where this book leaves off, I believe, and just adds a bunch more. And what this is nice about this is these are much more high risk, high reward. You get, you gain a lot more treasure and, and, and things of that nature. So these are great um, if you can go on these adventures. In my opinion, I feel they're far superior to the base book. But anyway, I love the idea of these random encounter. So in UnderQuest, I'm going to be having random encounters. And how it's going to work is when you um, resolve a card, it'll have a, uh, a letter on it. So A through I, I believe, is what I have right now. And the lower on the A, I think, are going to be more um, difficult or not so good for you encounters. And the higher up, they're gonna be better. I don't know exactly for sure which way the scale is gonna swing on that yet. Yeah, I do a lot more play testing, but in any case, you're gonna have a letter, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna roll a six-sided dice. So maybe your letter is um, G, and you roll a six-sided dice, you get a four, G4. So you'll go into a book similar to this, and you will read um, G4 as the entry. Uh, right now, I think that there's gonna be a total of uh, 54, I think I have decided on um, or 56 54 I think is how many um, entries I'm gonna have so it won't be quite as big as this but it will be a lot more than there were plot cards in Iron Helm and quite a bit more variety so yes not quite the same but I did like the idea of a dice making it random so when that card comes up and you see the G maybe you know well G's or maybe it's an A and you're like well that's not good I really don't want to read an A encounter because they're usually bad but then you don't know exactly which A so you when you decide then you roll the dice and you'll get something random so maybe there'll be one good really really good thing that can happen to you in the A encounters um, and then the rest of them are bad and we'll see so it's gonna be some sort of high risk high reward type situation there but I really enjoyed that so what above and below does well is it's a very solid worker placement game but it adds this uh, this um, a little theme and narrative by adding this storybook to it and I think it's some people might knock it for saying it's kind of um, gimmicky but it's not to me I think this is a beautiful example of taking two types of genres and bringing them bringing them together you're getting a solid worker placement game um, with all the tropes and you're also getting a, a fun narrative that allows the player interact because in my opinion one thing that can be dry about a euro worker placement game is a lot of time it's you're you're playing your game and everyone else is playing their game but you're not really interacting very much in this book reading having another player read to you and giving you that choice and all that really allows the players to connect and sort of brings everyone's game together so I think that's brilliant um, and the other thing <clears throat> one more thing I want to discuss about above and below is one of the mechanics that I stole from Ryan, and I don't know if this is where this mechanic originates or not, but if you watch my video on uh, Mineshaft Mayhem, which is the solo version for Dig Down Dwarf, I mentioned in that video the scoring mechanism. Um, I believe I mentioned in the video that I borrowed it from above and below. And how it works is you have all these cool types of resources, rope, mushrooms, I guess this is a fruit, or it's a fruit, but then it gets a pear, clay pots, whatever. You have all these random things. Now, some of them are much easier to get than others. They actually, on here, tell you the easiest ones to get are mushrooms. The hardest one to get down here is these gems. Now, now that's their rarity, and, and there's different ways of getting them. Now, most of the easier stuff can be found um, through building buildings and on, on, on easier adventures, but on difficult adventures, and once you start going underground, because you can go 
you can start building buildings um, in your subterranean below your city. Once you start building buildings there, then you can start um, producing some of these more difficult resources. So the point is, is some of these resources are easy to get, some of them are more, more difficult to get. And you keep them off to the side, but then at any point you can decide on your turn to put them in here. And you're gonna want to do it because there's the draw to do it because it, it affects your income at the beginning of the round. So the more of these you fill up, your income increases um, at the beginning of the round. At the beginning of the round, you get four at the beginning of the game, but as soon as you put one thing in here, now you're getting five. And if you obviously, like any worker placement game, getting that income to start building quickly early is important, right? So you can build more buildings, blah, blah, blah. And they do a great job with this because that alone makes you want to fill this in. But there's a catch. Um, now, if, if I put rope here, I always have to put rope here. And if I want to put another resource in, I have to put it in the next spot. And then whenever I want to put one of those resources in, I have to put uh, them in the same spot. So I can't put pairs here and pairs here. They all have to go here. So what does that do to you mechanically? Well, at the end of the game, you're going to score points for these resources that you place in these spots. How many points you get? This value here. So in this first slide, you're getting one point each, one point each, two points. So the further you, you the more items you get in here, the more points you're going to gain. So the, uh, the, the way to go about this to score the most points is you're going to want to put the rarest items that you can find down here because you're only going to be worth one point at the end of the game and they're going to also start bringing you up in your income. So the rare items you can get, and I don't know what other rare ones are, but we'll say these are, they look like they're rare in paper. Then all of a sudden, once you get up to a point where you're getting three points, now you can start dumping in some fruit here and some fish on this one here. And once, you, so you, the, 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 the way to really score a lot of points is to start with the rarer stuff, get these filled up as fast as you can and start dumping in um, the more common items because they're going to be easier to get towards the end of the game. You can score a ton of points. You can really score a ton of points here if you do this correctly. And that's what I use in Mineshaft Mayhem. So if you look at Mineshaft Mayhem, you're collecting the gems, but the first set of the first type of gem that you collect has to go into the first cart and they're only worth, I think, zero points at the end of the game, then one point, then two point, then three point, and four point. And that's how you score points in Mineshaft Mayhem. So in that game, you're also trying to get the rarest items, the rarest gems, the diamonds and or um, the emeralds in those first two bins. So that way, the easier gems like um, Sapphire and Amethyst, you can dump into the bins that are gonna score you the most points. And that is where I got that idea. So. My point in showing you this is I want designers to know, especially obviously newer designers, that it's okay to play a game and say, hey, this is a brilliant idea. I really, really like this. I'm going to use this portion and I'm going to build it into my game. And I think that's how we grow as a community of designers is we are open with our designs and we're not upset if someone takes an idea that's yours. It's not necessarily yours anyways and uses it in their own way. Now, obviously, you draw the line when someone's stealing your artwork or someone's taking completely your whole game and just retheming it. So yeah, there's, there's, ob there's obvious theft, grand theft larceny, but I think for the most part, when you're taking small ideas that you think are really well done or well executed or that you found enjoyable and you want that joy to be in your game, um, I think you got the green light. You, yeah, I utilize this mechanic in one of my games. I think it's totally fine. I don't know if Ryan Lockhart even knows who I am, um, but I don't think he would care. Um, and I think that's pretty much the 99% of the designers out there feel the same way. So that's all I really have to say about that. Let me know in the comments below if you're a designer or if you're not a designer, what mechanism in the game have did you find i guess this would be more geared towards a designer but what mechanism in what game did you find so interesting that you used it you borrowed it don't be ashamed it, there's no shame in innovation so let me know in the comments below if you're a designer if there's a game that there's a mechanism that you borrowed um, and utilized in your own game and, and what that game was and, and how you re-implemented it because that's interesting to me and I think it'll be interesting for other people to read. So thank you.
As always, thanks again for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Um, please like and subscribe. It means a great deal to me. Leaving comments is probably more important because I like that interaction and I like to see other people discussing the topics that are brought up. I think that really just helps out everyone in general. And if you have ideas for future episodes, obviously please leave those below as well. There's a few that were mentioned in prior videos that I'm working on right now. Um, anyways, I, again, I really do think this is an, a big topic that should be discussed more often um, and be more open with it. The idea of taking an, uh, an idea from a game or a mechanism from a game and reutilizing it, I think that that's fine. I mean, like I said, uh, artists of the past, this has been going on f with art for centuries. So to, to stop to say that you're not gonna wanna do that, or you're trying not to do that, it, you're, you're selling yourself short, and that's what we're supposed to be doing as designers. We're supposed to be taking ideas and building something new. That's what we do, we create. So um, I appreciate you stopping by again, and I'll see you next time, thanks. Mm -hmm.